Now, some of you, I, I, I have to admit, I, I bring out names that obviously older people would relate to, you know, so mea culpa, apologize for that. This guy's name is Paul Harvey, and Paul Harvey was on TV and radio for 50 years. He just passed away a few years ago, and he had this short 10-minute session he would do called, And the Rest of the Story. And, you know, one of the things, you know, I was listening to one of his... Uh, uh, presentations, and he, he's talking about, he always had this twist at the end of the story that you didn't see coming. Uh, so he's talking about this engineer in 1920, he's looking to buy a farm in England, and uh, he has some architectural skills, and he goes to buy, it, he's buying this farm, and it has a barn on it that has stood for over 300 years, and it's still made of wood, and it's never been replaced or repaired. And he says, well, that's impossible. So he walks into the barn, and it's just a beautiful structure, very, very solid, but very weird. It almost looks like a cathedral. You know, and he's looking up, and he's turning around. In fact, he, he, he sees something, but he can't get it, so he lies on the ground. He looks up, and sure enough, he's looking at this, and basically, he's looking at the hull of a ship. That is the, the foundation of this barn. And in England, back in the 1600s, ships always got the best lumber. So when they had, were finished, uh, farmers would actually take them apart and use the lumber to build barns. So he wanted to find out where this ship had come from, and he saw on one of the logs um, the name Southampton where the ship had been built. So he decided to go there. Now at this point, Paul Harvey would stop and say, and now for the rest of the story. And he went on to say that he went to Southampton and he found out that yes, this was a ship, and this ship had been taken apart after its last voyage where it took some people to the colonies. The people it took were the pilgrims and the ship was the Mayflower. And that Mayflower is now a barn in England and now you know the rest of the story. So we're going to apply this to the rest of this evening, the rest of this story. So a part of the issues for the liberals is about the concentration of wealth. Two years ago, Michael Piketty wrote a book about the 21st century capital and the concentration of wealth. In looking at countries like France and the US, compared to the robber baron years of the early 1900s, concentration of wealth has dropped 25%. But what concerned him was the fact that since the 70s, it has been on the rise. All of these things are completely true. So there's more income in the top 1%, there's more wealth in the top 1% than there was 40 years ago. However, when we take a look at all countries around the world and measure them based on upward mobility or more income equality or inequality, you, countries can be measured in terms of whether they are less mobile upwardly or they have higher income inequality. The worst countries are the US, the UK, and Italy. Where does Canada sit? Actually in a pretty good place. In fact, there are 10 developed countries that are worse off either in one of these categories or the other. So as David said, part of the challenge here is if you're going to fix a problem, you have to make sure you actually have it. So the part of the narrative around this is we're we, we feel we need to move wealth from the wealthiest group of people to the poorest group of people because there is a massive uh, income inequality or there's a lack of ability to move upward in society, which is true in some parts of the world, but is far less true for Canada. And what about the top 1%? Who are the 1% in this country? They are 135,000 households, average income 500,000 for the household, not the individual. Investable net worth, $4 million. They pay 21% of all personal income tax in Canada. But the interesting thing related to being a professional or a business owner who's incorporated, if you assume two thirds of the 1% are either professionals or business owners as opposed to something else like a I don't know, a prime minister or a, an athlete, for example, um, only 7% of all incorporated entities are owned by the 1%. In other words, 93% are not. So let's take a look at how this looks from the federal perspective, from the MP perspective. So the, we got this from the Canadian Taxpayers Foundation. So they did a, a survey of all of the um, MPs who had, either who had lost an election last election in 2015 or decided to retire, either one, and took a look at the value of their pensions. And essentially, this group, just this group of people, had collected pensions worth about $200 million. 
More importantly, they had contributed $18 million of their own money towards those pensions. So the retiring MPs, what do we know about them? Well, they get 3% per year of service, which is quite generous. It's indexed for life. It has survivor benefits. Roughly, for every $1,000 a year of pension they get, it would cost $21,000 in the marketplace to buy it at age 65 because of those indexing benefits. The biggest pension that was existed went, was $132,000 a year, worth $2.8 million. And that income, of course, can be split with a spouse when you retire. And the MPs fund less than 10% of the cost, as I mentioned. If I transfer this into um, a civil servant, let's take a look at this particular example. So this is a civil servant. Um, this is a couple. They're both 65. Only one has an actual pension, but they have both worked, so they have CPP and OAP. The pension's 100000 a year. CPP and OAS are about 20000 a year for each of them. So their total incomes are roughly $140,000. But they can income split, so they get $70,000 each of income. They'll have no old age security clawback. Their tax bill will be $14,000, or 20% of their income. Their net spendable income will be around $9,300 a month after tax, which is pretty attractive. The replacement cost for all their pensions combined is roughly $3 million. If they don't have those pensions, that's how much they need to have in retirement savings. Now, here's the question for you. How much of these assets are part of their official net worth? Anybody want to hazard a guess? Zero. Zero is correct. So part of the challenge with the way StatsCan measures things is defined benefit pension plans specifically do not have a lump sum present value benefit. So I can say to you, you have an income guaranteed for life of 100000 a year, or you can have $2 million. Let's say they're both equal. Well, if they're both equal, they both should have the same value. The $2 million will show up in your net worth. The $100,000 a year will not. So when we're talking about wealth, it doesn't make sense to say who's in the 1% if you're not measuring all of the wealth and all of the assets.